So today, uh, we're in week three of this conversation uh, about um, family. And we have said, uh, the title of the series is Help. I, uh, my family is not okay. And so for the last several weeks, we've talked specifically about marriage and what marriage looks like uh, from God's perspective. In week one, we talked about God's design for marriage, this beautiful, orderly design. All I can tell you is today um, and the, the last few weeks are built off of that original conversation where we believe the only marriage that God blesses, in fact, he condemns all other sorts as one man, one woman in the context of marriage for life. Uh, and so wherever you're at in your life, that is the goal. If you want to be married, that is the goal that you would become one and be fruitful and multiply. Anything outside of that is not God's design and is not blessed by God and ultimately uh, faces um, the judgment of God. And so we want to be clear on that because the enemy has a counterfeit. And we talked about that. Then week two, we said, uh, uh, I want a new marriage. Many of you came out and said, I want a new marriage. Uh, you learned about marriage. You learned about how to dig in and grow uh, in your marriage. And then last week, let me pause and say this. If you missed last week's message, first of all, we laughed until we almost cried. Uh, my kids got home and they were telling me, dad, you were a different level today. Uh, and then they were making fun of me. And, uh, and so uh, when my 16-year-old gets to laughing, I did something right uh, because he doesn't laugh a ton. And uh, so I just want to tell you, uh, we talked about wanting a new marriage and keeping God first two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about this conversation about pursuing your spouse, pursuing your two. Now, hear, hear me. If you'll get those two things right, everything will change. I promise you, everything will change. But if you're resistant to those two, you'll constantly have friction. The gears will be grinding against each other, and you'll wonder why your marriage lacks joy and lacks, uh, lacks the, the, the fulfillment that God designed. And so if you have not listened, make it a priority to go back and listen as we talk about how to pursue your two and what that looks like. Because the Bible says that God, uh, the hus a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. And the Hebrew word for united is dabak, which means to pursue, be constantly pursuing that relationship and the importance of that. And so today we're in another conversation uh, where we're talking about the promises that we're making to our spouse, making to God in this conversation around marriage. But Paul tells us, this is the passage we've been reading from in 1 Corinthians chapter number seven. Paul tells us marriage and family is complicated. If you don't believe that uh, and you're a single person and you think, oh, I'll get married, it'll all go away. Good luck with that. You bring your dysfunction, they bring their dysfunction and you realize two plus two doesn't equal four. Two plus two equals 4,000. Because now all of a sudden you realize, I, don't, I didn't deal with mine, so I didn't deal with hers, or she didn't deal with hers, and I didn't deal with mine. You got all this chaos that breaks loose. And so Paul tells us it's easier to actually serve God and live out your purpose without being distracted when you're single. And here's the way he says it in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. He writes it to a church hyper-emotional, hyper-caught up in sex, sexuality, spiritual gifts. He says it this way, for this world in its present form, is passing away. What he is trying to say is, no matter what comes your way, you got to understand it's going to die one day. It's going to move on. The most important thing is that you keep eternity in your hearts. And he goes on to say this way, because of that, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. What he's saying is when you're, when you're single... You're not married, you're focused on pleasing God alone. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. So now he says, not only are you trying to please God, but now you're trying to please your spouse, your wife. And his interests are divided. And when that happens, what can tend to happen is you can all of a sudden put your spouse above God if you're not careful. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and in spirit. Notice, I think that's, that's so interesting because he said both body and in spirit. But when you get married and the two become one flesh, the Bible says your body is not your own. His body is not his own. It belongs to your spouse in a very healthy uh, way. And so, but a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. Now, her interests are divided. He says, it gets, ready for this, complicated. And he says, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a way that is right, live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. He says, your priorities can easily, when you get married, get out of place. And so we're talking about priorities. And we made six promises in the first week. Uh, we've talked about two of them. We'll talk about another one today. The first promise is this. The promise of priority is that I promise that God will be my one and my spouse will be my two. 
You get this out of order, good luck. You're always going to have friction. You, if you cannot pursue the perfect creator of the universe and have a good relationship with God and make God your first priority, then you will struggle with any imperfect person in your life. And so God will be your one, your spouse will be your two. And last week we said, I promise, this is the promise of pursuit, to always pursue my two. Not when I feel like it, not when they earn it. I'm going to do it because God called me to do it and I signed up for this. And that's what marriage requires of me. And so today, here's the promise of preparation. I promise to prepare for we by dealing with me. I promise to prepare for we by dealing with me. And here's the dilemma that we face in our culture. Most of the emphasis on marriage and singleness in culture is on finding the right one. I just got to go and I got to find the person, got to find the person. Well, here's the problem with that. If I marry the wrong one, my kids are going to be wrong. Some of y'all didn't track with me. You see where like if you met... Now, all of a sudden, the kid, so there's this myth that there's only one person out there that's the right person breaks down because if you marry the wrong one, every child from that point on in all of history is wrong. And so what Paul is trying to tell us is that we're not looking to find the right person. The more important thing that Paul, Jesus, all, all the scriptures would tell us, the emphasis in the scripture on marriage and singleness is on being the right one, becoming the right one. The problem is culture doesn't teach that narrative. So today, we're going to talk about what is it like, what is it like when you go on your first date, single people, your second date, your third date? What is it like, married people, when you go on a date or you sit in your living room and you haven't dealt, you haven't dealt with me before trying to make we? Let me read you an article from Psychology Today. Let me give you some snapshot on how culture sees marriage. Four ways, first of all, I want you to listen to the title of this. Four ways to figure out if you're with the right person. Okay, do you see the the problem with the language here? Why not four ways to figure out if you're becoming the right person? You see where the emphasis is on like, well, I don't know if they're good enough. Now I want you to listen to these four ways, and then I want you to see the, the fallacy of the culture in which we live in. Number one, here it is, assess how satisfied you feel in the relationship. That ain't a good idea if you just had an argument. That's great if everything's great. But you, here, here's the, feelings are like children. I said this a few weeks ago. I stole this from Jonathan Moynihan. Feelings are like children. They're great to have in the car with you. They're terrible to have driving the car. Okay? You don't assess how you feel. Marriage is a covenant, not a contract that's broken based on the way we feel. Here's the second one. It gets worse. Ask yourself, have you ever been more satisfied in another relationship? If the answer to that is yes, what are you going to do? <laughs> Especially if that person's also married. Come on. What good is that question? Because we're not looking at marriage as a covenant if we are asking this question. All right. Here's the third one. <laughs> it gets worse. Or can you easily imagine being more satisfied? Thank you, psychology today, for destroying marriages. After you've done all of this, number four, ready? Okay, after you've done all this, determine if you need to do some self-work. By this time, you're divorced. (laughs) And now you're doing self-work for the next person, right? Let me know. We've got to focus on becoming the follower of Jesus that God has called us to become. And in doing so, we will realize now somewhere along the way that, that, that we are becoming something and we're journeying in this thing. Okay, we're, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking. And as we're pursuing Jesus, we look to our left and we look to our right. And all of a sudden, oh, there's somebody else pursuing Jesus at the same intensity that we are who's dealt with their junk, who's gone through the issues, who loves Jesus. And all of a sudden, uh, because I'm serving Jesus and they're serving Jesus, I have a friendship that develops. And now we can actually focus on Jesus first in our marriage, not one another completing each other. All right? This second service. First service is a whole lot more lively. Okay? So stay with me. Third service is a fire. I'm telling you, third service, y'all need to come sometime. 
That, they shout me off the stage. But I want you to hear me. We have got to begin to pursue Jesus and quit looking for the right one. Y'all ever been on a bad date? Come on, anybody? Oh, yeah, now you're talking. <laughs> ever been on a bad date where you look your best, guys, you shave, you clean up, you spray some cologne, maybe hopefully you took a shower. Ladies, you put on your makeup, you did your hair, you got dressed up, you got out of your flannel, you know, pajamas that you wear and your hoodie all day, you got dressed up and you went, you cleaned your car, sir. Hopefully you went on the date and he opened the door for you. Come on, somebody. You're like, I don't need no man to open the door for me. Maybe you need to deal with your daddy issues. <laughs> because here's the reality. Chivalry's a lost art. He's not opening the door for you because you're incapable. He's opening the door for you, hopefully, because he realizes you're a daughter of God and he's doing it unto the Lord. Yeah. You hear me? Let's get rid of culture's narrative. You deserve to be pursued, ma'am. Stop letting culture tell you you got to do it. On, you, look, yeah, you, I want you to be independent. I want you to be strong. I don't need you to need a man. But I want you to understand you're valuable enough to be pursued by a man. Or else you don't need to be married. So, you get your car cleaned. You pull up. You sit down at the date. Maybe this is your first date. Maybe that you've been married 20 years and this is the way your date looks. Except you don't clean your car no more and you don't take a shower anymore. You show up and you're going to have a good date and everything's great. Car's clean. Just don't open the trunk. Because you might get bit. Because in the trunk is the baggage. How big of a trunk? Some of y'all need a U-Haul. You're going to pull a U-Haul on your date. So my goal today is like, you know, Chip and Joanna Gaines, they would refinish furniture and do all that kind of stuff and make us all feel very insecure about our decorating abilities and all of that. Okay, here's what I, when you, when you go to refinish the furniture, you strip it all the way down to the wood. And when you get to the wood, now you can see the imperfections in the wood. My goal today is to strip it all the way back in your life where you can actually deal with the imperfections. Deal with me before you get to we. Or if you're already in we, you stop blaming we and start dealing with me. So, any of y'all like to fly? Anybody? Anybody hate to fly? Okay, I don't mind flying, but there's two things I hate about flying. Number one, I do not want a middle seat. Because inevitably, the person beside me is going to have body odor. It's just the way, or uh, changing a diaper of a baby right there, right? So, I hate a middle seat. I also don't like getting on the plane early. It's like, I can have priority board in first zone, second zone, whatever. And they're like, you're going to board early. And I'm like, no. I'm getting on as close to the time that door closes as possible, right? Because especially if you're going on a three or four hour flight. And so I will pack, if I'm traveling alone especially, I will pack my, my, my carry-on luggage as small as I can because I don't want to wait at baggage claim. I don't want to do any of that stuff. Right? I just want to go. I just want to get out the car, check in on the app, roll through security, and then get to the airport and then pick up my rental car and go to save like an hour of time, right? Problem is you get to the gate, and then everybody went before you, you're supposed to carry on. Listen, let me just, if some of you are these people, we will never be much closer than we are right now. <laughs> you get one carry-on bag that fits in the overhead compartment above you and one small bag that should be small enough to fit underneath the seat in front of you. The crap I have seen in overhead of compartments. I got on a flight from Dallas and your boy had three cowboy hats spread out and dared me to move one. I thought it was going down on the plane right there. <laughs> he said, you better not move my cowboy hat. I said, or? <laughs> and so here's what I need you to understand. When I get to the gate, I'm like the last three people. And they're like, it never about 10 people. Sir, the overhead compartments are full. We're going to have to check your bags. It'll be free of charge. You can pick it up at the... I fly enough, sweetheart, I don't need free check bags. They're already free. And so I used to get mad, and I used to fight. No, get on that plane. Tell them flight attendants do their job. Sorry, this is me therapy session right now. Tell them do their job. Get that crap out from the overhead bins. You let that person on. Now I just let them tag my luggage, and I get on the thing and take the tag off. How they going to know? <laughs> no, they didn't tag. I'm sorry. You just have to find somewhere. That's what I plan to do. Some of y'all laughing and you're like, that's so rude. No, you're rude. You did it. You're the one that made me that way. 
It's rude. You know, when you get on the plane, here's the, and some of y'all trying to sneak on extra stuff. Hear me. Some of y'all approached your marriage the same way. You brought all your stuff. You knew you're not supposed to. You knew you're supposed to deal with it, but you brought it in and said, just deal with it. Everybody else will have to suffer. Too far? And so you showed up with all your bags packed full of your junk. So today, it's not an original message. I saw this message about 15 years ago. And I learned real quickly, we got to unpack our baggage. You better claim it first. Some of y'all are going to, I ain't got no baggage. I don't know whose that is. <laughs> okay, we're going to assume you claiming it. And now we're going to unpack it. Let's do some fun stuff. The first one is this. Oh, we struck a nerve. <laughs> you remember when mom used to cuss you out? Remember when dad abused you or abandoned you or hurt you? Remember when they used to yell and scream and you never could live up and now you see everything through the filter of what your mom and dad did to you? Come on. Now you look across the table at him or you look across the table at her and they'll never be good enough because you never dealt with all the junk here and now you're trying to get validation because you didn't get validation here. Remember when you went and you, you, know, the, you played sports and you were always looking to see if your dad was in the stands because he didn't make your games? Or maybe he made your games and you felt like you couldn't enjoy the sport because you never were good enough to live up to dad's expectations? Come on. Dad, Stop. Quit trying to live vicariously through your kids because you weren't good enough. Don't make them have to live up to the failed expectations you had on yourself. Let them be a kid and enjoy the sport. Maybe you finally won an award and you wanted somebody to celebrate you, but it was like, hey, I, I'm, I'm good. But mom and dad didn't do that. You never could do good enough. And so what was supposed to be the ideal family photo, it's all shattered. Now you just show up at your first date and say, uh, this, this is what it looks like. Take a good look at that because it's dysfunctional. Or maybe, young lady, here's what you did. You remember when dad hurt you, abused you, abandoned you, mom did it, and all you could do was cry yourself to sleep at night. You laid in the bed at night wondering if you'd ever be good enough because you felt some of the rejection by your family, by your parents, by your mom, by your dad. And now every date, dad is there with you in your subconscious. Mom is there with you in your subconscious. Everything you see, now you see through the filter of that pain. Maybe generational sin. Maybe you came from a divorced family. You had a broken relationship with your father. You had no one ever love you for who you are, young lady. And you just wanted to be in the arms of a man who would love you. And you stumbled right into it for one night. How did that leave you? Just wanted to feel loved. And then it was another man or another woman, men. You come from a long line of bad tempers. Always trying to prove yourself. I mean, there's some good stuff you learned from your family, maybe. Those are the things we like to be proud of, but what about the other stuff? Listen to me, young lady, young man. You want to know how their family is? Invite their parents on a date with you and see how they interact with their parents because that's probably what, unless they deal with some stuff, that's how your family's going to interact one day. I know it's hard, but it's reality, isn't it? And so now we thought, Young lady, if I can just get a man to approve me, I'll be happy. Young man, if I could just live up, I could have validation, I'll, I'll be happy. And you carry your baggage into a relationship and you expect the other person to deal with your baggage. Okay? Here's the second one. Habits and hang-ups. You say, why you got a pillow? Because there are some people that are just plain lazy. Like, listen to me, sir. First of all, it, if you, if you want to get married, before you get married, before you get engaged, get a job. 
Learn to pay your bills. You know what the Bible says? Peter says, uh, any man who does not provide for the needs of his family has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, I get it. Some of you guys, you married a trust fund girl. That's great. Don't give you permission to be lazy. You're created to work. Maybe you can stay at home with the kids. Well, learn to keep a clean house. Learn that when she comes home or you learn to help her. Maybe she's a part of a successful business and you don't have, maybe you decided to stay home to be a stay at home. That's fine. I'm not mad at you, but that better be the cleanest house in this church. She shouldn't come home to messes because you lazy. Here's, this is called habits and hangups. I got some bad habits. I got some bad hangups and things that I've done in my past or continue to do that have controlled me. Here's one. Dad was an alcoholic, so you became an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic, man. I just I'm not quitting time. I won't quit. Quit today. See how that works. Quit today. Quit for six months and say, oh, I don't need to. No, no. That, no just sh- First of all, prove it to yourself. I'm quitting time. I'm if you find this drowns away all your fears or keeps you stable or keeps you from, you just got a problem. It's a habit. It's a hang up. Okay? Maybe for some of you, it's uh, the things you're looking at on your screen, the things that you are searching on the internet, the things that you constantly do when nobody's looking. And you think somehow God's going to bless your family, bless your marriage, bless your sex life, but you can't keep your eyes off. You need to unpack some baggage and talk to somebody. See, this is the area that shame hits the most. But God, listen, we've learned that shame grows in the dark. Maybe for some of you, you're like, I'm a workaholic, man. I'm just out chasing. I'm working for the dollar. I'm working. Dollar made me holla. That's too close to home, y'all. We in Henry County. For those of you watching online, just Google, honey, boo-boo. And uh, so now you got all this because you think of that. That's what's going to make you significant. You're a workaholic. And now you come home, you got all that, but you have no relationship here. Maybe you got addictions, you got hurts, you got unforgiveness, you got anger problems, you got spending habits. Come on. You got gossiping habits. Here's a strategy for you. Ask your friends, somebody that will tell you the truth, okay? Here's the question that you ask and see what they say. You say, um, what is it that everybody wants to tell me about myself that they're scared to tell me? I will not respond and I will not cut you. Go. And they're like, really? I promise you there's some people be like, you're a jacked up, obnoxious, you know, and they'll tell you. And then you shut up and go to your other friends and go, hey, uh, this, this is what I asked. They told me, can you tell me how I do this? Don't go and say, tell me I'm not. No. And then they're going to say, they actually said that to you? I've been wanting to say that for a long time. <laughs> you get confirmation from a few trusted people. And then you get accountability. You get a plan, a strategy to fix it. Not like, I'll do better. Like a plan, like what are you going to execute? What are you going to get done? Not what are you thinking about doing? Do you see this? And so you act on the plan. This is intentions versus actions, right? And then after the plan, three months, six months, a year, you go back to those people and you say, how am I doing? Have I grown in this area? Speak life into me. Speak truth into me. Do you see this? Where are my Celebrate Recovery people at? Y'all know what I'm talking about. I think some form of Celebrate Recovery conversation, whether it's here on Tuesday, some, that same strategy needs to apply to all of us in some way. Because it teaches you to be authentic. But there's something that keeps us from being authentic. Here it is. This one attaches to you, and it becomes almost your identity. It's one that you don't, you don't put it, I mean, you like you carry it. Like you show up for the date with it, just like this. Hey, y'all, brought my backpack. <laughs> what you got in there? Here it is. Wounds and words. Were you abused as a child? Physically, sexually, emotionally? Were you constantly talked down to? 
You can't be authentic because you don't even know who you are because you've believed the ideas that other people said about you or done to you. It's seared into your soul. You've been told you were stupid. You've been told you were a loser. You've been told you were worthless. You've been told, I wish I never knew you. I wish you were never born. I wish I never uh, dated you. I wish we had never gotten married. I wish, I wish, I wish. Somebody's violated your trust or abandoned you. And the entire time you're with him or you're with her, you will try to approve to them in an attempt to show, I am valuable. Will you validate me? Because nobody else did. And now everything that's said by him or her is filtered through the way you were spoken to as a child. And you're holding him or her in a place of um, unhealth because you can't deal with the wounds that happened to you or the words that were spoken to you as a child. You haven't dealt with it, and now everything is seen through that. The problem is you never found your identity in Christ. And when you don't, here's what you do. You go out looking for him or her. And there's been a lot of hymns for some of you and a lot of hers for some of you. Because you thought that relationship was going to fill you. And then that one, and then that one, and then that one. And after all, this is the jacket she gave me that I ended up giving back to her because she was cold and she kept it. Right, that's the way it works. He gave me this, this is the blanket that I used to, oh, it smells like him. He hurt me, she hurt me, they left me. They took advantage of me. They promised me the world and left. And now, I've left a little piece of my soul with him or with her. And so now, I have unresolved past relationships and now I'm going to try to build a new one. I'm trying to prove something to him or her that like, look, I'm just telling you like, I, I, I had a boyfriend, Joe, man, you'll never be Joe because Joe was my man. Shay, man, I'm telling you, Shay was my girl. She's, you got a lot to live up. You see like, the, you see where this kind of, or it's, rather than that, it's like, he hurt me, will you hurt me? She hurt me, will you hurt me? Because you left the place of your heart and your body with someone else. And now there's a little bit of you there, 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 and there. And you're trying to be whole here. This is where dating goes awry. We'll talk about that in a minute. There's not a lot of hope for success here because half of you is spread out everywhere else. And now you take all of your previous relationships and you say, are you going to take care of me? Are you going to do this? And that's a lot of pressure. See, I'm a firm believer that we need to move away from the dating model in America toward a little bit different model. Actually, something you can see more in the early church model in the, uh, the times of, of Christ is something called courting. Somebody said this to me after, after first service. They said, um, when there's more courting before marriage, there's less court after marriage. I was like, uh, that's going in my notes. What is courting? Courting is where your family is. And you say, well, that's my family. I don't want them involved. And I'm like, but ideally, we need to change family. We need to start the process. Now, my boys weren't allowed to date until they were 16. One might not get a date until he's 20. I don't know. But 16 was not dating like, hey, be back at midnight. It's like, hey, y'all want to go to dinner? Let's go to dinner. We'll all go to dinner. We'll all share, you know, the old Charlie's rolls. We'll do that. I mean, like, we're going to be courting as a family because what happens is now we set boundaries, and boundaries have blessings. And now I'm not letting my sons give a little piece of their heart away. And let's be honest, too much alone time, their body away if we're not careful. Come on. And now they're whole when it's time to move forward. You don't believe boundaries have blessings? I had a little dog one time, a little shizu dog. She got out late one night. Somehow she got under the fence, and then a little while later, Julie goes, uh, where's the dog? You, 
we didn't have kids at the time, so the dogs liked the kids, so I basically lost the kid. And um, she said, uh, where's she at? We couldn't find her. She was gone. We looked up and down. She, Julie's ha- she's crying. We've been married like two years. I'm thinking, I hope it make it. we make it. And um, so I'm printing out flyers, putting them all around town. Lost dog. Please contact me before my wife leaves me. That's what I felt like, right? No, she wasn't going to do that. But like, it, like, there was only kids, like a kid. And so we go to bed that night. She can't sleep. And the next morning, we hear clawing on the door, the dog. And she's like, she's home. She's all crying and all that. And so I just remember that moment. I was like, this dog's never getting out again. So I put one of those electric fences in the ground, right? Put that shock collar. Thank you, sir. Put that shock collar <laughs> on that dog. Dog went out. She didn't understand what the beep meant. It's like, beep. <laughs> and we're watching. It's good entertainment, too. And uh, <laughs> it go beep. And all of a sudden, she got too close. It's like, Rrr. you're like, that's, that's pet abuse. No, she's fine because she didn't wander out in the road. That dog lived a very healthy life, never rebelled against her parents. <laughs> because boundaries have blessings. I'm being facetious, but you understand where I'm coming from? All right, I got to hurry because we're already late. Real quick. This one. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. Because this is how you saw marriage. <laughs> we're going to wear matching outfits on the beach in Hawaii. You're like, my bathtub's broke. I can't even swim in it. <laughs> we'll complete each other. Is he the one? Is she the one? And you go on every date wondering like, oh, are they going to complete me? Are they going to be the one? Come on, listen. Asking if he's the one, if he's going to be all that you want him to be, is, is a lot of pressure to put on a dude who doesn't know which fork to eat his salad with. Okay? What you're asking is, will they accept me? Come on. Is she going to make me happy? Is he going to fulfill me and make me whole? What it comes back to is when we were in elementary school and we were on the playground and we were the last one picked, we're like, hello, me. I want somebody to pick me. Will you be the one to pick me? Do you see how superficial this is? It's out of a place of brokenness. And then we think, oh, she picked me. I'm going to, I can be your hero, baby. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's a lot of pressure to put on someone to make you feel valuable and complete. Listen, I, I think I'm a great husband. But on my best day, if she's looking for me to complete her, she's going to be miserable. Only God. Here's the last one. Please tell the kids workers. They were running late. Put this one in a black suitcase because this is the one we like to hide a lot. You ready? Whoo, you know what pride is? It's the cover-up for insecurity. Pride is just insecurity with a mask on it. Look at me. So now you walk around and all you're trying to do is prove how good you are. Come on. Look at me. I can take care of you. What you're saying is, I hope I can take care of you. Right? And so, I even got a hero award right here. You think I'm kidding? It says 2023 hero award presented to relevant church. I just thought it was cool, so I brought it. And like you're trying to prove, like, I can do this, I can do this. Like, look at me, look at me, look at me, I'm strong. And then you realize two years in, they weren't exactly what you thought they were. Come on. And const- she's constantly trying to make herself look good and decorate and Instagram filters and he's done. And then there's this whole conversation about, oh, look how, you know, I work out because I want to look good, not because I want to be healthy. I'm not saying anything's wrong with looking good. I'm just saying, what? You- hey, how about we watch our cholesterol so I can live to see my kids grow up, right? It's, it's this idea of pride. And so now you get married. You got all this junk. You got this on your back. You got habits, hang-ups. You got pride. And now something goes wrong, and you wonder, like, uh, why, why can I never apologize? Because I've, I've pretended to be. I had it all together. My insecurity never was dealt with. I never could be vulnerable. 
I got to be perfect. I got to act perfect. I can't mess up. And if I mess up somehow, I'm a failure. Now, single people, I'm closing with this, and then I'm closing with something else. <laughs> Singles, lean in. Beginning in April, we're going to start a I think I want to be married one day class. I don't know what the name of it's going to be. I'm just trying to tell you. If you're like over the age of 16 and you're like thinking about marriage one day, like you need this. If you're dating or you're engaged, you need this. And so look for, look for this because the first two weeks we're going to teach you how to think differently about getting engaged and getting married. Then the next four weeks of that, which you can come back for, we're going to teach you actual skills of marriage before you get married. So here's the, here's the process if you want to get married one day, single people. Number one, first of all, unpack your baggage and deal with it. Go to a counselor, go to CR, deal with your junk so that you can be whole. Are we clear? All right, number two, become friends before dating so that you'll be friends after you're married. Be friends first. All of a sudden, the friendship, you're like, hey, no, no, girl, you cute. We've been friends for like two years. This is weird. I never thought, you know, that's the better way than like, girl, you hot, but your attitude sucks. I mean, you know, do you see the difference? Okay. Here's number three. Ask the question to a trusted spiritual advisor before popping the question. <laughs> if you're already engaged, don't get mad at me. Lean in. Too many people go ask, they get engaged. Now there's this emotional tie. We're getting married. We got, the, we, we got a date. We spent 1500 15000 on a ring, whatever. To only now all we do is wear these like rubber gaskets on our fingers. And so like, like we've done all this and now we've ordered invitations. And, and will, you, can, will you marry us? And we're like, um, your oil and your water, no. Then you're mad at somebody for telling you the truth. I have told many people, I can't, I can't marry you until... And they don't do it, and they go on two years later, they're divorced with a kid. Somebody's got to tell you. So ask the question to a trust. Hey, what are your thoughts? I'm thinking about proposing. I'm thinking, we've talked about maybe getting engaged. What are your thoughts on that? And let them speak truth to you and be like, look, he got daddy issues. Man, she's got some things she needs to deal with. Let's slow this roll down. Don't get so emotionally attached before you. And then be like, I dare you to say something. Then once you pop the question and you get engaged, here's step four. Ready? Immediately afterwards, get premarital counseling. Not four weeks before you get married. Hey, will you marry us? And they're like, oh, well, let me just go to, like, get premarital counseling. Deal with the junk. Go to this class we're going to be doing. Sometimes that's six weeks, 12 weeks, whatever. And then here's the one that's going to blow your mind. After counseling, quickly host an inexpensive small wedding. But, but I mean, that ain't a real wedding. Because it didn't cost $39,000 like everybody else's. 50% of marriages end in divorce. I don't want the happiest day of your marriage to be your wedding day. $39,000 invested in an index fund at 10% over the course of 40 years. From the time 25 to 65 and you retire, you'll retire a multimillionaire. I hope the wedding was worth it. If you never make, so take some of that money. Here's the next one. Spend the wedding money on counseling and nice experiences for the first couple of years. $39,000 is the average wedding in America. 50% of marriages end in divorce. Do you see? Build a strong, strong foundation. Last thing. Paul tells the church of Philippi. He says, not that I've already obtained all this, talking about pursuing God's plan for his life and living out God's calling, or have I already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. What he's saying is, I got a lot of things I haven't gotten right yet, but brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I've got to let go of some things and push forward, not go backwards, not stay stuck, not dwell on the past, deal with the past and start the journey forward. That's what it means to pursue Jesus. So here's your takeaway. The first step in preparing for we is to take hold of the one who took hold of me. His name is Jesus, who died on the cross for your sins and for mine, who laid down his life so that you could have life 
And not life like this, but life more abundantly. When you fall in love with Jesus, you put him in his right place, you submit your entire life to the authority and the lordship of Jesus, that's when you can actually deal with me and not feel like you're not worthy because you understand how worthy you are because the one who gave his life says you're worthy. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for you. And then I need you to immediately make a beeline if you have children and go get them. (laughs) Take a dollar out of your pocket and tip our kids' workers, okay? (laughs) Let's pray together. If you've got some issues that you need to deal with based on some things I said today, lift your hands as a sign of surrender right now. Come on, all across this room. And on your way out today, if you lifted your hand, we got people at the I Choose Jesus wall. You just say, I need help. I need to talk to somebody. I need Stop by the I Choose Jesus wall. Maybe you need to make Jesus the center of your life. Stop by there and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. They'll help you. Come on, hands lifted all across this room. Father, you see our hands. You see our desires. You see our hearts. And that's the first and foremost. Put you first. Deal with our junk. And then pursue our two and lay down our life for the cause of Christ as a couple and as a family. Speak to your people. Give them the audacity to take the next steps today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said,